All right, so first, thanks to Tippleton for making this possible. This is all grand. Um, and, and thanks to all the presenters uh, so far. Uh, it's, it's really been pretty amazing to see the talks, and thanks to all the commentators on other people's talks. It's been uh, uh, really informative. So as is always the case, when Jen and I do this, I'm going to do very little. Uh, and, and she's, she's going to do all the heavy lifting. So, uh, so I'm just going to run through a little bit about what we were up to in the beginning. I'm going to set the stage, and then for the the purposes of presenting the data, um, where I'm pretty useless in general, do the, the hard work. So uh, we're going to start with uh, what humility is. Uh, more specifically, I want to talk about part of my job when we first started this was to survey the, the philosophical literature and the literature in theology uh, and the literature on psychology, but mostly philosophy and theology on uh, the different conceptions of uh, humility that you find uh, historically. Now I'm going to run through this. If you want more of this, we have a whole paper. Uh, that's probably more than you want, and, and we can send that to you. So this is uh, my, whole, the whole, my whole part of the project compressed into uh, a couple slides. So that's what we're going to do. Um, the first view, and I think it's, it's where I want to start, is what we call uh, the low-mindedness view or uh, the self-abasement view, and it's connected to these sorts of um, these attitudes where uh, you think uh, not necessarily less of yourself, but you think uh, very lowly of yourself. And one of the things that was interesting about the self-abasement view wasn't only that you had this sort of low-mindedness, it was that according to this view, that low-mindedness is epistemically justified, right? So it's not just that you ought to think uh, you should have a low opinion of yourself, but you really ought to have a low opinion of yourself because uh, you're, very, you're worthless. And uh, I'll give you a couple quotes here in a second. So uh, here's, these, are, these are all from uh, running from the 14th century to uh, the sort of mid-15th, 16th century. The first is from the cloud of unknowing. Uh, humility here is defined as true knowledge and experience of the self as you are, a wretch, filth, <laughs> far worse than nothing. Uh, Horneck and Hor uh, this is uh, Kempis from, uh, of the imitation of Christ. Uh, learn to obey, you dust. Learn to bring yourself down, you earth and slime, and throw yourself under all men's feet. Show yourself so lowly and simple that all may tread you underfoot like mire in the street. And then finally, from uh, Hornick, the happy aesthetic, this is from mid-1600s, uh, a truly humble man that does despise himself and is contented to be counted not only humble but vile and wretched too, that is contented his defects and infirmities should be known, bears injury patiently, and looks upon himself as nothing. So um, it's no surprise, perhaps, uh, that this conception of humility, while it is a very popular conception of humility, it's, it's built into the dictionary definition, uh, it looks like uh, this is the conception that certainly uh, lots of philosophers rejected. So one of the reasons philosophy, that humility got a bad name, at least according to our story, one of the reasons that philosophers ranging from Aristotle, who would have said it was a kind of vice, this sort of low-mindedness, uh, Spinoza uh, denied that humility was a virtue, uh, Hume dismissed it as a, monk, as a mere monkish virtue, uh, Nietzsche, as Mark pointed out yesterday, had nothing good to say about it, understandably, uh, uh, Sidgwick didn't have, I mean, so this, this was a whole trend, right, of philosophers uh, suggesting that um, humility uh, was in fact not a virtue. But of course, like whether you think something's a virtue is going to depend an awful lot uh, on what it is. And so one of the things that Jen and I were interested in from the, the outset was, uh, especially this model, um, we call it a variety of humility. Um, this is a variety of humility. It was at one time a very popular variety of humility. What we suggest in uh, the paper uh, is that it's not a variety, to steal uh, Dennett's terminology, it's not a variety of humility worth wanting. Um, and so then the question was, well, if this is a variety of humility worth wanting, are there varieties of humility? Uh, they're not worth wanting, there are varieties of humility that are worth wanting. And that was part of our, our goal. So. Um, here, uh, there's another type of humility or variety of humility. On the one hand, you could view it as uh, false humility in some sense. This is acting like you think less of yourself. Here, you're simply uh, misrepresenting. And it's not clear this is humility proper. Uh, but uh, according to another count, uh, humility involves not necessarily low-mindedness and self-abasement. Because you might think, how do we, reserve, how do we uh, reclaim humility and make it look not so horrible as this kind of vile, wretched self-abasement? Uh, and so not talking about humility, but talking about modesty, uh, people like Julia Driver uh, and others have developed an underestimation view of, of modesty, where it doesn't mean you have to think that you're, that you're low and you don't, you don't have an accurate opinion of yourself if you think you're, you're vile and wretched. Uh, instead, uh, humility merely requires that you slightly underestimate or, or partially underestimate or to some extent underestimate uh, your own value, your own accomplishments, your own worth. And in, in both cases, 
uh, in the first case, it looks like it involves the deception, the active deception of others. In the second case, it involves, in some sense, either being ignorant or self-deceived, because it looks like you, you need to be, in some sense, out of touch with uh, your, own, uh, your own value and worth. So we actually think uh, both of these views are problematic for different reasons. Uh, in the first case, it's just problematic because we actually think uh, that you, um, if you, if you think you're, you're vile and wretched and should be trod upon under everyone's feet, then this is actually probably inaccurate for most of you, I hope. Uh, and in this case, uh, it requires um, a different kind of, it requires you to have uh, inaccurate belief. And so we thought, well, these are two uh, conceptions of humility uh, that are, are not worth wanting. Uh, we probably think this one's a little more not worth wanting. Uh, this one, uh, too, has problems. Uh, of its own. So what we decided instead uh, was to focus on, and we'll, we'll present some data that suggests that we were on the right track. What we decided instead, as we went through the literature and the, the sort of the picking pieces from here and there, the part of humility that we we liked was uh, a version of humility or a variety of humility that focused on uh, psychological orientation and more specifically this notion of uh, decentering. Uh, of oneself uh, relative to others. Uh, C.S. Lewis, it's actually been attributed to lots of people, so I don't know where this quote came from, but uh, you can find it online. Uh, not, it, so on, on this conception, humility is not thinking less of oneself, it's thinking of oneself uh, less often, and also thinking of others more often. Right? So humility has these sort of, on our view, that's sort of the core, the two core components of humility is this sort of decentering, uh, where what you get is a kind of uh, psychological positioning within the larger context of uh, the surrounding uh, universe. So we think that this, this on this conception of humility, it's sort of a two-pronged uh, piece. Uh, it's, uh, to be humble is to be both epistemically and ethically aligned. So what do we mean by ethically aligned? Uh, here, uh, it means to understand and experience ourselves as we, uh, in fact, are. Uh, namely, is a very small part of something grand or larger, whether you're looking at yourself as a smaller part of a community or a smaller part of the, of the country or the smaller part of the universe or the smaller part of God's plan or whatever it is. It's got this sort of relational component. Uh, this is often uh, experienced, right? So spiritually, we experience as a, as a connection to God or a higher force or being. Uh, but even uh, among the secular, you can have an awareness of your place in connection to the natural cosmic order. And we call whichever of these two, uh, we call this a kind of existential awareness, namely being uh, aware uh, in an accurate sense, being aware uh, not of your lowliness. This isn't a function of being insignificant. It's just a function of having an appreciation of the role that you play uh, in the grander scheme of things. On the other hand, uh, we think that this type of humility uh, has an ethical component. Here you understand and experience, we understand and experience ourselves as only one among other morally relevant beings with interests as real and legitimate and as worthy of attention and concern as our own. And then here, this serves as a, a kind of corrective or antidote against our tendency, uh, probably biologically driven, to strongly prioritize our privilege and seek treatment for ourselves, uh, often even at a uh, significant cost to others. So here, what we want to call this is a state of, of, of kind of extended compassion. So <coughs> the sort of two pieces, so that's our sort of account of the, the core. Uh, we think that these are the two pieces. There are other pieces that you might think are important or other facets of humility, but these are the two that we took as the, at the, the center of humility. And then, of course, uh, this made it a little bit easier for us to uh, operationalize uh, humility. So on the, on the one hand, uh, we uh, have uh, a notion of there being a sort of low self-focus. Uh, this does not mean that you have less self-regard or self-esteem. That's another problem with the first view of humility we looked at. It looks just outright incompatible with self-esteem. If you think you're vile and wretched and corrupt, etc., uh, then you don't have any sense of uh, self-worth. And so here we think uh, humility is perfectly compatible with self-esteem and self-worth. Um, and uh, not, it doesn't even require reduced self-concern, uh, but the idea is you just don't uh, prioritize yourself to the same extent as someone who's not humble. Here, the behavioral manifestations commonly include uh, a lack of desire to self-aggrandize or self-promote, an openness to new uh, and challenging information, a simplicity in uh, self-presentation and or lifestyle. So here we get things like modesty and open-mindedness, which Jen will talk about in a minute. And the other uh, facet that we operationalized was increased or high other focus. I'll talk about this increase versus high in just a second. So an increase in one's orientation outwards. This is that notion of decentering, specifically towards other morally relevant beings, accompanied by an increased, uh, on the one hand, prioritization of their needs and interests and concern for their well-being. This is the notion of extended compassion I mentioned a second ago. And on the other hand, an appreciation for the values of others uh, more generally. So here we, we can make some predictions about the sort of behavioral manifestations we would expect. You would expect someone who had increased 
uh, other focus or high other focus to have a greater acceptance of others' beliefs and values and ideas, even when they're different uh, from uh, one's own. You'd also expect the humble on this account uh, to have an increased desire to help others and to be of service. Now, the, really quick, the increase high is just to say that what we really want is to say that people who are humble or have high other focus and people who are humble have, have low self-focus. The notion of reduce or increase is this idea that it might very well be that part of how you end up being humble is being humbled. And so humbling experiences, whether it's in the eyes of God or whether it's the awe of nature, they have this tendency uh, to uh, reduce your focus on yourself and to increase uh, your focus, if everything goes right, on other people. So that was how we, how we started the project. And today, we have a couple other things we've been up to, but uh, for the purpose of today, Jen's going to talk about at least just three of the projects that we've been investigating. The first, we wanted to find out whether the full concept of humility actually uh, aligned with what we took to be the most plausible conception of humility that we found in the philosophical literature. So we, we have some data that she's going to talk about about the full concept. Uh, we investigated the underlying constructs of humility, so we designed a scale. Uh, unlike uh, some of the scales I've already been talked about, uh, this is not focusing on intellectual humility, it's focusing on this other kind of humility more generally, like moral humility more generally, but um, hopefully you'll, have, uh, you'll see some uh, overlap and some interesting intersections. Uh, and then the third project is to investigate the relationship between humility and other constructs and other sorts of behavior and how uh, humility itself is manifest. The humble team, uh, here I am with my wife who, Oh, am I? <laughs> Hold on. But we're, uh, yeah, I haven't even seen. I haven't even seen this slide. <laughs> That's not very humble. <laughs> well, Jen. <laughs> ah, that's right. So backing up, he stole, <laughs> he stole my thunder. The first project that I'm going to talk about is the Folk Concept of Humility project. And I would like to introduce my team, our team. Right? You all know this bald guy. Right? And myself, but three um, students that were absolutely invaluable in, in making this project happen. Uh, here's Matt Eccles. Um, this is actually in, a, in Cambodia at one of the, um, the temples in, outside of Siem Reap. When he learned that he was going to be our lab manager, this is him taking his most humble pose. <laughs> right? And then we had Tyler Perini, who was a math whiz, who helped us with our, um, our semantic analysis, which I'll talk very briefly about, hopefully. Um, presenting, here he is in Amsterdam, where we were presenting some of our research on humility. And Kelly Benizia, who is here presenting on her bachelor's essay, she did a lot of the, um, the coding as well. So for the folk concept, um, uh, project, what we did is we had participants, um, some collected through MTurk, some collected through the lab. We also have middle school and high schoolers where we just actually went to the schools and collected this data face to face. And we had them take a moment to reflect on humility. And we did say virtue of humility specifically for a reason because we wanted to help protect against um, the worry that people might think of humility as something more like humiliation, right? Um, what would it be like for someone to fully possess this virtue? Please describe as full, in as full detail as you can what someone like this would be like. And in our adult sample, we had 107 participants. Adolescent sample, 251. And then what we did is we went through and hand-coded this, and we had actually triple blind coding, um, just to be excessive. And we, we offer the number of discrete concepts that came up uh, in their descriptions of humility, and then these were further categorized into uh, overarching categories. So we had 20 categories for the adult sample and 26 for the middle school and, and high school sample. Let me tell you a little bit about that. So um, the first thing, of course, that we were interested in is the degree to which some reference to low self-focus and high other focus was present in their descriptions of the, the highly <laughs> humble person. And what you can see is that there is a, an interesting developmental trend um, in terms of both of these. So when, when it comes to decreased or low self-focus, uh, it's, it's very present, um, almost to 100% in the adult sample, uh, but you can see increasing evidence of it in the younger sample. So if, uh, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, and eleventh, twelfth group together. Um, same thing over here. And we were looking for what we took to be um, the primary manifestations of both uh, low self-focus and high other focus. One, this reference to being part of something larger than yourself, or being, um, uh, you know, displaying modesty, not bragging or showing off, which was obviously uh, much more present in the younger samples. And then on the other focus side, uh, valuing others as sort of openness, 
and then a, a desire to help or be compassionate in some way. So you see uh, a trend in the presence of these concepts in their discussion of humility. And then here's a nice uh, graph across the age groups of the, pr the presence of low self-focus and increased self-focus with this little interesting sort of egocentric dip right here for the 11th graders. Um, not exactly sure what's going on there, but they tended to refer to it less. But otherwise, a really nice developmental trend um, in terms of the presence of these uh, concepts. Of course, there was a lot more to their description of humility than just a sort of low self-focus and high other focus. We saw a wide variety of other concepts emerge. And one, uh, and I won't spend a whole lot of time on this, but one that's of particular interest is right here. Right, so particularly for the youngest group, the fifth and sixth graders, there is a lot of emphasis, even though we did take the, you know, make an effort to make sure that they were clear, that we're talking about humility, not humiliation, um, and you know, where you want to describe someone who's humble, and, and we had a, a discussion with them about it, you see quite a bit of reference, 40% as a matter of fact, to some sort of, um, they're, they're embarrassed, they have low self-confidence or low self-esteem, uh, description of them having these embarrassing experiences, of feeling bad about themselves or being made to feel bad about themselves. And in a further uh, analysis of this, and then also looking at some of the, the data that we had with, with adults, what it suggests, it, at least on, you know, initially, and there's obviously a lot more work to be done here, it suggests that Participants are seeing one of the ways that you get to being humble is by being humbled, right? So, and if you think about it, if you're in a state of egocentric, if you've got an egocentric perspective, it's being knocked down a notch or embarrassed for a position that you've taken or shown to be not as good as you thought you were is one of the first steps to reshifting our orientation. So it was something that not surprisingly the younger kids focused on quite a bit more, but we see this even in the adult data when we ask them to describe examples of, of experiencing humility. One of the things that they talked about is experiences where they were humbled. And that was a way for them to, to move into a more humble position. OK, um, just, this is just looking at that graph in a slightly different way in terms of overall contribution. So here again, you can see that the younger kids had a, a, a more negative or brought more negative concepts into the discussion of humility um, with the embarrassment, uh, people who are humble, being sad, lonely, afraid, shy, having suffered some sort of hardship, which is again consistent with the idea of being humbled on your way to humility. A seventh and eighth graders starting, though, to see humility's connection to a larger range of moral constructs or moral traits. So <coughs> people who are humble are also admi admirable and dignified and honest and hardworking, reliable. Um, the, the, um, also, um, in terms of psychological well-being, because we're interested certainly in not only humility's connection to our more larger moral character, but also its contribution to our psychological well-being. And here, you know, happy, content, calm, peaceful, patient. Uh, polite, courteous. The ninth and tenth graders' biggest contribution was, "Hey, dude, they're down to earth. They're simple. They're easygoing." Um, and then, the, and also, focusing interestingly enough on this, these sorts of cognitive benefits of being humble. One is that you're confident, but you're also willing to acknowledge your mistakes. So it's not as if you're not able to be confident, but you're also willing to acknowledge your mistakes when you make them, and you're generally hardworking. So some interesting stuff going on there. Um, then the next thing that we wanted to do is look at whether we could develop a scale that would measure these underlying constructs. And of course, um, we all are aware, very aware of the problem with self-report measures, <coughs> right, some of the difficulties of asking people if they're humble or not. Um, and we wanted to take those seriously. We were interested in, in developing a self-report measure. Um, so we needed to figure out a way to get around this issue as much as we possibly could. And we were also um, dissatisfied with some of the dominant scales that are already out there, um, in particular the, uh, the VIA and the Hexaco, um, in part because they run directly into the problem of self-report that, that uh, June was worried about, but also they conflate humility with a number of other constructs. So the Hexaco includes honesty, fairness, greed, avoidance, um, the VIA has modesty in there. And we also felt that conceptually the VIA's placement of humility as a, uh, what do they call it, a character strength under the larger virtue of, of temperance was itself problematic because at least the way we're conceptualizing humility, these other virtues that are a part of the VIA are, are equally relevant, right, in terms of transcendence and humanity and wisdom and all seem to be um, relevant to humility. In fact, it turns out that they're all related. Um, and in fact, our humility scale is related to all of the VIA uh, uh, character strengths. I'm not sure what to make of that. but. 
Um, so what we did is we ended up creating a uh, basically a grocery cart full of items, everything that we could possibly think of. Their slides keep changing in that room over there, and it confuses me because I think my slides are changing. <laughs> so sorry, <laughs> keep getting disoriented. Um, so we threw everything that we could think of at it, all the possible items that might be um, a part of humility or be related to humility, because we wanted to see whether our, the idea of low self-focus and high other focus emerged from this wider range of topics. Um, so we ended up... Uh, just to give you a basic idea of, of the exploratory factor guidelines, pretty standard guidelines. We chose to do um, the eigenvalues, so we paid attention to the discrete products as well. Um, orthogonal rotation, and I can justify that later if someone wants to argue against it. Um, basic factor loading criteria, and throwing out any items that are correlated with social desirability above 0.2, because obviously social desirability is a real worry when it comes to self-reports on humility. Okay, so we did three rounds of exploratory factor analysis, um, moving from the 210 items down ultimately to 25 items through a range of um, item selection and addition and subtraction uh, with you know, all the, the number of, of individuals that you're supposed to have with a pretty good representation in terms of gender, not quite as good representation in terms of ethnicity, and obviously this is a US sample to start with, though we're hoping to expand beyond that later. Um, and as you can see, this is at round two, we ended up with not only some of the, the constructs of humility that we're, we're expecting to find, but a wide range of other related constructs like modesty, moral flexibility, moral conviction, open-mindedness. So at this point, what we did is we went in and we forced factor analysis. So this is what comes out at the exploratory level. But when you force factor solutions, something interesting emerges, right? And that is that throughout the first six factors, uh, these right here hang together. So they resist breaking out into separate factors. They hang together in one cluster in a way that the other ones, when given the opportunity, break out. So we, we felt secure in thinking that this is getting at something at, at a core sort of construct. So we have these sub-factors, um, religious and cosmic humility, kind of a, a more religious and a secular version of low self-focus and other focus, with this additional piece of value of humility, which is an indirect way of getting people's attitudes about humility. So I'm not asking you how humble you are, but I'm asking you how you feel about humility. What are your attitudes about humility? So we pulled these out. We've <coughs> developed a separate scale for modesty and open-mindedness that's that you guys, it's also available if anyone's interested in it, but we took those out. We ended up for the third round introducing, breaking what was kind of the existential awareness cosmic and in humility into two parts, a cosmic and an environmental, so one's connection to nature as opposed to one's connection to the universe. And it, here we thought one of the interesting things about this approach is it's asking people about their relationships to these larger constructs. It's not asking them about humility at all. And yet it, we, we argue it's getting at um, th their humility in terms of their uh, reduced self-focus or low self-focus and high other focus. So here you see reduced self-focus breaking into three sub-factors, like sub your other focus, and then your value of humility. Um, all of which had strong alphas and factor loadings and good correlations. And then we did a confirmatory factor analysis on that structure, right, the five sub-factors. Uh, all the standard weights, crownbacks, alphas, and social desirabilities were all where they should be. Goodness of fit indices were all well where they should be, so thing looked pretty, things looked pretty good. And we ended up with a confirmed final scale, 25 questions, five sub-factors, which we are happy to make available to you should you want to look at it or use it. Okay, so with that scale, we then went on to do a variety of other things that I'm, I've got five minutes to talk to you about. Okay, so let me fly through them. Oh, very quickly, um, some of the reliability and validity stuff that we've been looking at. So inner item correlations, it just shows what you should expect to find is that the items within each of the sub-factors <laughs> should be more correlated than with the other sub-factors. And here, notice that I also have the modesty and the moral flexibility is included there, but the, the core is the, um, the, of the... Uh, humility scale is, is there. Cronbach's alphas are all very high for the items. Um, split half reliability is you simply take the scale and you split it into two parts and then you look to see whether they are, um, they predict that the scores are the same and they are um, 0.9, almost 0.9 highly correlated. Test, retest with about a four month window, four to five month window in between. You see that there's no significant difference between their scores, so all good. Developmental trend in terms of 
And I say developmental trend loosely because these are not obviously longitudinal days. This is entirely cross-sectional, so who knows what's going on. But you see an interesting trend in terms of, and in particular what's interesting is that, um, the split between environmental and cosmic ended up being um, a really important one because <coughs> kids really relate to the environment in a way that they haven't really started relating to the universe yet. Right? So you see cosmic humility playing much more of a role in adults' attitudes than in, in the, the younger kids' attitudes. Um, but a, a general trend in terms of age groups and then looking at it related to the adult sample. And the adult sample is collapsing across everyone from early 20s to the 70s. So there's even more of an interesting developmental trend when you break the adults out into different components, age groups. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to show you this slide. Uh, so we were interested in this question of what might humility be related to, what sorts of things um, would we expect humility to be related to. And here again, I'm going to be packing a whole lot of information into a few very colorful tables like this, right? So here um, we administered a, ver a range of scales, uh, already existing scales, right? So the humanitarian egalitarian scale, civic responsibility, which has um, young adult and, and adult versions, the empathy quotient scale, which breaks into emotional, cognitive, and social. You'll notice cognitive is not up there because it wasn't correlated. Um, agreeableness, honesty, to humi honest humility, which is the hexaco openness to experience. And then the moral foundation questionnaire, just because I was interested to see, and it's odd that it's strongly related to every one of the moral foundations, but there you have it. Um, stronger correlations generally with the adults than the high school students or the middle school students, but still some interesting stuff going on there. There are a couple scales that we administered just to the high school students or just to the middle school students. Uh, one of them is the Scales of psychological well-being, so we're interested in the extent to which it's related to other factors of, of, of well-being. And um, interestingly enough, it's related not only to uh, uh, measures of one's personal relationships to others and one's connection to community, but also to self-direction, autonomy, personal growth, things that are very much self-oriented. There's still strong correlations there. Uh, an agreed scale that we developed earlier on. It's negatively related to both economic greed and a related measure of relational greed, the extent to which you want people to give you things and not have to give them back. Um, and this is just the scales, a whole range of other scales that we administered just with adults. And again, notice that like, so for this, the Schwartz value scale, notice that it's strongly correlated. And I didn't do the correlations just because it seemed like it'd be too busy of a table. Um, but it's, it's strongly correlated with not only the more community-oriented values like universal and benevolence, but it's also related to self-direction and achievement, though not to power stimulation or hedonism. So a certain kind of agentic development is consistent with humility, right? Moral identity, moral integrity, gratitude and hope, and gratitude across several different scales, love and kindness, guilt evaluation and the desire to repair, but not, and also shame, but not shame withdrawal. So the tendency to experience shame for one's bad behavior, but not the desire to withdraw from, from uh, reparations. Forgiveness, intrinsic but not extrinsic religiosity, faith maturity, uh, secure attachment, and it's also negatively correlated with insecure attachment, and an anxious attachment specifically. Um, the dark four is <coughs> healthy, psychopathy, Machiavellianism, sadism, and narcissism. So it's negatively correlated with those positively correlated with the positive life scale, both framework and purpose, appreciation of simple pleasures, appreciation of others, and then sy systems thinking is the tendency to think in terms of the larger, when you're trying to solve problems, thinking in terms of the larger system that you're, that the problem is a part of and is, is connected to. Okay, one minute, here we go. Um, so one of the projects that we're moving forward with that we're hoping to get some, some additional funding for and that we're arguing for is that um, humility, we think of humility as potentially being a foundational virtue. In other words, it's a state of being that's, or trait, or whatever you want to call it, that's necessary though not sufficient for the full development of other virtues. And this is a view that, not, that I, um, interestingly, came across support for in a spiritual development um, manual by Rabbi, and now I'm going to forget his name, I should have put it in here, where he, it's this, it's this Musar Institute, a friend of mine's in the middle of doing this spiritual path development, she's like, oh yeah, it says it right in here, humility is the foundation for all our virtues, so I feel justified and vindicated. <laughs> Very quickly, um, because there's not a lot of time, we, one of the things we're also interested in is whether humility would reveal itself through the way that people communicate with others, and one of the things that we thought we might see is in people's writing samples. So if we ask people to write about, to reflect on their life, 
in terms of a variety of things. One of the writing samples was, thank you, um, just asking them to reflect on their relationship to the surrounding universe. I think you have to push, yeah. Here. There we go. Um, God, God or creator, the earth, I environment, fellow human beings. And very quickly, um, we, we separate, again, having m multiple coders involved, separating them into humble and non-humble exemplars. It ended up being correlated with their actual humility scores quite highly. Um, other focus a little bit less than the others, but still highly enough to, to, be, to move forward. And then we did, uh, Tyler, uh, who is the math genius, did all kinds of really cool um, analyses of these uh, writing samples. And one of the things that he found is that, uh, and I think this is consistent with some of the things that people have been talking about here uh, this the last couple of days, the humble exemplars, the humble writing, they tended to use a lot of inclusive language. So they, so they talked about, and this also shows up in when we have them write about disagree, a disagreement with someone else. They include a lot of language that is designed to, to develop a sort of common shared ground, whereas the non-humble exemplars use language that's much more exclusive, specifically excluding themselves from whatever is under consideration. Um, they tended to, interestingly enough, use a lot more inclusive lists, like using and, whereas on the other side they used or. Who knows what to make of that? Um, and they used language that was designed to break down boundaries and to, to, to acknowledge connection and obligations with others as opposed to infusing a sort of judgmental and dismissive view about whatever issue it is that they're considering. And we did a topical analysis, which is this I can't, NMF decomposition, which is not unlike exploratory factor analysis, where you look for topics that emerge in the writing. And when it comes to the humble exemplars, they hung together very tightly, but there was a little bit of a difference be between people who took a universalistic perspective. So they, they tend to think in or talk in terms of we're all equal, we all have the same rights, we all should be treated similarly, as opposed to benevolence, which is more, you know, we ought to care for one another, we need to, you know, we need to be concerned for the well-being of others. And on the non-humble side, people could be non-humble in three different ways. One, they blamed everybody for their problems. Okay. Two, they, just detrust, they were distrustful and skeptical of, of God and everybody else. Or they were just indifferent. They didn't care about any of these things. They didn't have relationships. They didn't care. OK. Last thing, quickly. Response. We did a lab study where we had people actually come in and sit down with someone who disagreed with them on an issue. Of course, this was a confederate, not a paid actor, but a student who came in as a, as a confederate and they, were, they knew what the issue was ahead of time and they took the opposite position to that person. And what we found is that people's humility scores were positively related to not only how they evaluated the discussion afterwards, and the confederate was instructed to always continue to disagree. Reasonably, not, not that got, got aggressive a couple times on the part of the participant, not the confederate, but to, to disagree. So they never came to a consensus, but they positively related the discussion, trusted the con conversation partner more, were more willing to actually give money for parking to the conversation partner afterwards. And when we had them set up their chair before the conversation started, they sat closer to their conversation partner and were more oriented towards them. So they faced them more and sat closer, even though they knew they were going into a room where the person that they were going to talk to disagreed with them about something they already identified as being very, very important to them. And this was something they identified several weeks earlier. Okay. We also found that people's humility was related to their willingness to donate to outgroup foreign international organizations relative to local organizations. And this is cool because it fits in with Mark Alfano's stuff. We asked them to brag about themselves. They had to write a paragraph of at least a thousand words where they had to brag about themselves. And then one, their humility score from earlier, like a month earlier, predicted how low energy they felt after that was over. And this is related to stuff that Will Fleeson and Patrick Gallagher have done on contra-trait behavior. When you have to act inconsistent with your trait, that tends to exhaust you. So they felt way more, they felt less energy after doing it. Plus they inflated their humility scores afterwards. So it predicted the degree to which they inflated their humility scores, not only the specific subscore, but also their attitudes about humility. So in other words, the correlations between their previous religious humility and their now religious humility was significant, and also their values of humility. So they valued humility more, and they rated themselves more highly when they started out already lower on that score and then had to brag about themselves. So that's it. I'll have Ron McHugh. We have
10 minutes and keep your questions short, please. Thank you. So, it's a wonderful topic. There's almost too much information here to really process the moment. Um, I, I had a question about the relationship a few slides ago about um, the relationship between humility and skepticism. Uh, okay. So, maybe you say a little more about that because I would have thought that, you know, sort of skeptical attitude towards things might be uh, positively correlated with humble design. Right. Here, here you see a specific sort of uh, skepticism and distrust emerging in the writings, like God's just a sick joke, is one of the paradigmatic examples, um, where people are talking about the fact that they don't trust other people, they don't trust, you know, they, they, they're skeptical about having any connection to the environment, they're skeptical about God existing, or being, you know, so they're, they're, they're communicating a particular type of negative attitude that's not the same as you know, I, I'm, I'm withholding judgment until I get more information or something like okay. that. So I would agree. Yeah, you, you showed the, at the end there some information about the priming task of uh, having them brag mm -hmm. and showing the, the, how that goes with the scores. Did you do one with the opposite where you had someone reflect on like a weakness or horrible failure? No, okay. no, because I want to see whether this would work. Yeah. I come across those pieces of paper I'm concentrated to give them, oh, this is a wonderful way to test whether somebody has the trait or not. Because <coughs> yeah. like, the idea is that if you, like you did it with extroverts and introverts, so if you get introverts to act extroverted, there's all this interesting downstream effect. Um, or no, it's actually ext extroverts have a hard time being introverted. <laughs> then introverts have being extroverted, because we have to be extroverted all the time for all of you people. Like, we have to pretend <laughs> like we're extroverts. <laughs> As a card carrying introvert. Um, so, so I wanted to just test it and see whether anything happened. And I was actually pretty surprised it came out strong as it did. But that would be a really interesting thing to try, is to have them do the opposite, where they're really having to assume a sort of humble position, and then see how that's related to, to uh, what we get the opposite of. Yeah. A few slides in your correlation slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that uh, the MFQ subscales were all correlated yes. in adults with, yep. there it is, um, with uh, your new measure. And it looks like it's just in adults and not in middle schoolers or high schoolers. Well, a little bit here, but not much. It's definitely stronger in uh, adults than it is in even middle schoolers. Do you think that's a longitudinal, that, does that relate to the longitudinal stuff, or is that an MFQ issue? It might be an MFQ a... issue, because the students were, because I kept the questions as they were in the original scales, oh, okay. and there were certainly a couple of them that the students weren't clear on. And one of them, they found that they, they just were all, the Twitter about the one about it's okay to kill people. I can't remember. It's one of his. One of his. They're like, oh, they talk to each other about it. So <laughs> who knows? But um, so it may have been just a scale issue. It's really. It would be interesting to go in and try to, to figure out more about that. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, do you know what that's yeah. Same topic. Same yeah. No. Same topic. So um, it was a different topic. So I, I um, was lost. I lost track of. Significance and religious significance. Mm -hmm. Are those terms used significance? No, just on the scale or in the, the right example? Uh, <coughs> on the scale. Okay, yeah. on the scale. Okay. We, we don't actually have the items. It's not oh. that. So I can, I'll send it to you. Okay. I didn't include I should have just had a slide that had all of them. This is something different. Okay. This is the right example. The right example. So okay. there it's, I, I, I have to go. It's an actual wording. I have to go back and look. Okay. The scale. Uh, it's kind of wild. Okay. But it's about their relationship to the universe kind of more generally. Okay. Can you zoom this up for a second? Sure. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, about the fact that the younger kids were more likely to associate humility with being humble. Mm -hmm. I was wondering whether there was any plausible bit of suggestion that they just didn't have a broad enough vocabulary to be able to distinguish sure. the nuances involved. It's entirely possible, though we really tried to protect against that that is definitely possible. But the reality is, is that humility isn't something that's it's getting a lot of discussion at their age, right? They're just not really familiar with it. The way that if you said bravery or honesty, they'd be much more on board with what that concept means. It, one suggestion against that is that there certainly were, even when they were describing it negatively, there are often indications that they, they were on to something, that, they, that it was connected to this, this larger thing of being more um, considerate to others and being less 
you know, less focused on yourself. And there were a number of young children that, that were right on. They had beautiful examples of the sort of thing that we were looking for. So it's hard to say, but definitely conceptual confidence is going to be an issue that's worth looking at more, more closely. Ricky, anybody have a question? Yes. <laughs> so, I, just want, I need a second look at So, um, so uh, maybe I'll just check on something you said at the very beginning about um, the idea of more conceptual humility as being epistemically aligned with relevant um, facts. And in, in, from the cosmic perspective, there's a sense in which that's kind of worrisome. Because you might think from the cosmic perspective, uh, that epistemically aligned testing themselves is extremely insignificant to the point where it suggests that the appropriate response is depression or suicide. Mm -hmm. We're so incredibly tiny Thank in the entire you. universe. Yes. And so what I'm wondering about is, is to the extent that you're getting these independent things, they, they, more assumption here is that people who have um, who are theistically inclined will be diminished in that reaction because there's a sense of meaning that that, will, um, that compensates for the sense of insignificance. So what I'm wondering about is these two different measures, cosmic insignificance versus a theistic reference and how they relate to each other. You see any modern and they, 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 they come apart. They come apart. They, they do in fact they come apart. So the environmental and the cosmic they, they they pretty much went lockstep most of the time. But they look like they worship so that but I don't know that it came apart in the way that you're suggesting. Um, there'd be an easy way to do it, just to give us something like the Vex Depression Index or something. Mm -hmm. Right? So you just get the scale, and then the idea would be that the people who score. And it's, um, I didn't include correlations that were at the subscale level, but there, um, uh, the, the self focus is negatively correlated with depression and anxiety using the Vex state <coughs> depression and anxiety scale. So it actually. At least with the samples that we used, and that was adults only. We didn't we didn't use those with the with the middle school or high school students. It's negative correlated. It's just the average humility is at that point up here. So I mean, but it, it does seem as if it would be one of the perhaps what we might say is a developmental step that you know the, sinking into a sort of nihilism or existential angst, right? That then you have to dig your way out of. Is it certainly possible? Our, I mean, there, one argument would be that you're not all the way there yet, because the other component of it, which is recognizing we're all in the same boat, and we're all kind of in a position of, we're in this together, which then lead, might lead you out of it, hasn't happened yet. So how does the work, I, I know this is the exact same thing, it's on the scale, right. but the, the representation of others, how does that relate to the, the first point? Uh, I mean, in terms of the scale? Yeah. They're strongly correlated. Yeah, so, yes, so the focus does correlate with the lesson. Maybe that's not problematic. Maybe there's a story that we can tell us why that is, and maybe not. 